Let's begin with lymphoid structures. The first structure that we will review is the lymph node. Remember that the lymph node is a secondary lymphoid organ that has many afferents and one or more efferents. It's encapsulated and it has trabeculae traversing through the cortex and medulla of the lymph node. The lymph node's functions are nonspecific filtration by macrophages that are present within the lymph node and that migrate to the lymph node, also storage and activation of naive B and T cells, as well as antibody production. The lymph node is broken into the follicles, the medulla, and the paracortex. The follicles are located in the cortex of the lymph node. These are the site of B cell localization and proliferation. In the outer cortex of the lymph node, we see both primary and secondary follicles. Primary follicles are smaller, more dense, and dormant. They contain naive or inactivated B cells. Secondary follicles have pale central germinal centers within the follicle itself, and this is the site of activation of B cells and B cell proliferation and expansion. Moving further towards the center of the lymph node, we see the medulla. This consists of medullary cords, which are closely packed lymphocytes, and plasma cells, which remember are antibody-creating B cells. We also see within the medulla medullary sinuses. These sinuses communicate with the efferent lymphatics, and they contain reticular cells and macrophages as well. In between the follicles of the cortex and the medulla, we find the paracortex. This is the T cell zone. This is where they live. This region contains high endothelial venules as well, through which T and B cells enter from the bloodstream. In an extreme cellular immune response, this paracortical area becomes greatly enlarged with B cells and T cells that are active and expanding. Remember that immunology and response is all about proliferation. So what do you see when somebody gets infected with a virus, for example, are swollen lymph nodes. Well, why do they swell? Because of the expansion in this paracortical area. It's also important to note that sometimes we don't see well-developed lymph nodes in people with immunodeficiencies. And a classic example of this is with the Georgia syndrome. Remember that the lymphatics are responsible for draining the tissues and filtering out potential antigens for an immune response. So clinically, we can predict where one might have an infection or, say, a tumor, depending on the lymph nodes that are becoming enlarged. So it's important to recognize which area of the body drains to which lymph nodes. For example, the upper limbs and the lateral breast drain to axillary lymph nodes. The stomach drains to celiac lymph nodes. The duodenum and jejunum drain to the superior mesenteric lymph nodes. And the sigmoid colon drains to the colic and then to the inferior mesenteric lymph nodes. The rectum and the anal canal above the pectinate line drain to the internal iliac nodes. The anal canal below the pectinate line drains to the superficial inguinal nodes. The testes drain to superficial and deep plexuses and then to paraaortic nodes. The scrotum to superficial inguinal nodes, as well as the thigh, the superficial thigh, to the superficial inguinal nodes. And the lateral side of the dorsum of the foot drains to the popliteal lymph nodes. Remember, these lymph nodes then drain into larger and larger ducts, which then eventually drain back into the circulation. On the right half of the head and the right arm, we drain into the right lymphatic duct, and everything else drains into the thoracic duct. Let's move on and talk about the spleen. The spleen is another organ like the lymph node that's involved in filtration of antigens. The spleen has sinusoids, which are long vascular channels within the red pulp of the spleen with fenestrated or barrel hoop basement membrane. The macrophages in the spleen are found near these fenestrated barrel hoop basement membranes. The T cells in the spleen are found in two places, in the periarterial lymphatic sheath or the PALS and also in the white pulp. The B cells are found in follicles, just like they're found in the lymph nodes, within the white pulp of the spleen. So we have, again, three areas. We have this basement membrane where the macrophages are found. We have the T cell in the periarterial lymphatic sheath. And we have the B cell follicles within the white pulp. 
Macrophages will remove encapsulated bacteria as well as filter other antigens. But when you think of the spleen, you should automatically think of filtering encapsulated bacteria out of the blood, which will be clinically important later on. If you have splenic dysfunction, what you have is decreased IgM production. Without the IgM, you will have decreased complement activation through the classical pathway, leading to decreased opsonization because you have less C3B, which increases an individual's susceptibility to encapsulated organisms. And remember, S. shin for the encapsulated organisms, salmonella, strep pneumo, H. flu, and Neisseria meningitidis. So think about what would happen if you don't have your spleen. We see this in patients with sickle cell or in somebody who might have to surgically have their spleen removed. Without this activation, they're more susceptible to encapsulated organisms. Other things that we see in people that have splenectomies are howl jowl bodies in the blood, which are nuclear remnants, target cells, and also thrombocytosis. Another organ important for immunology is the thymus. This is the site of T-cell differentiation and maturation. Remember that it is not the site of T-cell production. They're born and raised in the bone marrow before they go off to the thymus for education. Like the spleen and lymph nodes, the thymus is encapsulated. It comes developmentally from the epithelium of the third branchial pouches. The lymphocytes are of mesenchymal origin. Like the lymph nodes, the thymus has a cortex and a medulla. The cortex is dense with immature T cells. The medulla is pale with mature T cells and epithelial reticular cells and contains the Hossel's corpuscles. Remember that the thymus is the site of positive and negative selection. These both occur at the corticomedullary junction as the T cells mature and pass through the thymus. Remember that positive selection is MHC restriction. It's when T cells find out if they can recognize MHC. And negative selection is when T cells find out if they're reactive or non-reactive to self. Only the T cells that recognize MHC and are non-reactive to self will make it through thymus education. So remember, both T and B cells are born in the bone marrow, but when it comes to maturation, T cells mature in the thymus, T and T, B cells mature in the bone marrow, B and B. And that concludes this section of the review.